Chapter 7 of Music Notation and Terminology. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jillian Brandt, St. Paul, Minnesota. Music Notation and Terminology by Carl Wilson Gerkins. Chapter 7 Scales. 76. A scale from scala, a Latin word meaning ladder, or German, tone lighter, is an ascending or descending series of tones, progressing according to some definite system, and all bearing, in the case of tonality scales at least, a very intimate relation to the first note, the key tone or tonic. See page 28, section 78, also note 1 at bottom of page 38. Many different kinds of scales have existed in various musical eras, the point of resemblance among them all being the fact that they have all more or less recognized the octave as the natural limit of the series. The difference among the various scales has been in the selection of intervals between the scale tones and, consequently, in the number of tones within the octave. Thus, e.g., in our musical scale, the intervals between the tones are all whole steps, except two, which are half steps. And the result is a scale of eight tones, including in this number both the key tone and its octave. But in the so-called pentatonic scale of the Chinese and other civilizations, we find larger intervals, e.g., the step and a half, and consequently a smaller number of tones within the octave. Thus, in the scale upon which many of the older Scotch folk songs are based, the intervals are arranged as follows. One whole step, two whole step, three step and a half, four whole step, five step and a half, six the result is a scale of six tones corresponding approximately with C, D, E, G, A, C in our modern system. The term pentatonic is thus seen to be a misnomer since the sixth tone is necessary for the completion of the series, just as the eighth tone is essential in our diatonic scales. The following Chinese tune, called Jasmine, is based on the pentatonic scale. Seventy-seven. In studying the theory of the scale, the student should bear in mind the fact that a scale is not an arbitrary series of tones which someone has invented, and which others are required to make use of. It is rather the result of accustoming the ear to certain melodic combinations, which were originally hit upon by accident, and finally analyzing and systematizing these combinations into a certain definite order or arrangement. The application of this idea may be verified when it is recalled that most primitive peoples have invented melodies of some sort, but that only in modern times, and particularly since the development of instrumental music, have these melodies been analyzed and the scale upon which they have been based discovered, the inventors of the melodies being themselves wholly ignorant of the existence of such scales. 78. A key is a number of tones grouping themselves naturally, both melodically and harmonically, about a central tone, the key tone. The word tonality is often used synonymously with key in this sense. The difference between key and scale is therefore this, that while both key and scale employ the same tone material, by key, we mean the material in general, without any particular order or arrangement in mind, while by scale, we mean the same tones, 
but now arranged into regular ascending or descending series. It should be noted in this connection also that not all scales present an equally good opportunity of having their tones used as a basis for tonality or key feeling. Neither the chromatic nor the whole step scale possess the necessary characteristics for being used as tonality scales in the same sense that our major and minor scales are used. 79. There are three general classes of scales extant at the present time. 1. Diatonic, 2. Chromatic, 3. Whole tone. 80. The word diatonic means through the tones. In other words, through the tones of the key and is applied to both major and minor scales of our minor tonality system. In general, a diatonic scale may be defined as one which proceeds by half steps and whole steps. There is, however, one exception to this principle. In the progression 6 to 7 in the harmonic minor scale, which is, of course, a step and a half. 81. A major diatonic scale is one in which the intervals between the tones are arranged as follows. One whole step, two whole step, three half step, four whole step, five whole step, six whole step, seven half step, eight. In other words, a major diatonic scale is one in which the intervals between 3 and 4 and between 7 and 8 are half steps, all the others being whole steps. A composition based on this scale is said to be written in the major mode or in a major key. The major diatonic scale may begin on any of the 12 pitches, C, C sharp or D flat, D, D sharp or E flat, E, F, F sharp or G flat, G, G sharp or A flat, A, A sharp or B flat, B. But in each case, it is the same scale because the intervals between its tones are the same. We have one major scale only, but this scale may be written in many different positions and may be sung or played beginning on any one of a number of different pitches. 82. It is interesting to note that the major scale consists of two identical series of four tones each, i.e., the first four tones of the scale are separated from one another by exactly the same intervals, and these intervals appear in exactly the same order as in the case of the last four tones of the scale. Figure 53 will make this clear. The first four tones of any diatonic scale, major or minor, are often referred to as the lower tetrachord, and the upper four tones as the upper tetrachord. It is interesting further to note that the upper tetrachord of any sharp scale is always used without change as the lower tetrachord of the next major scale involving sharps, while the lower tetrachord of any flat scale is used as the upper tetrachord of the next flat scale. See figures 54 and 55. In figure 54, the first four notes you hear compose upper tetrachord from scale of C. The second four notes you hear compose new tetrachord to complete scale of G. In figure 55, the first four notes you hear compose the lower tetrachord from scale of C. And the final four notes you hear compose new tetrachord to complete scale of F. Eighty-three. From the standpoint of staff notation, the major scale may be written in 15 different positions as follows. Scale number one, C major, 
no sharps or flats. Scale number two, G major, one sharp, F. Scale number three, D major, two sharps, F and C. Scale number four, A major, three sharps, F, C, and G. Scale number five, E major, four sharps, F, C, G, and D. Scale number six, B major, five sharps, F, C, G, D, and A. Scale number seven, F sharp major, six sharps, F, C, G, D, A, and E. Scale number eight, C sharp major, seven sharps, F, C, G, D, A, E, B. Scale number nine, F major, one flat, B. Scale number ten, B flat major, two flats, B and E. Scale number eleven, E flat major, three flats, B, E, and A. Scale number twelve, A flat major, four flats, B, E, A, and D. Scale number thirteen, D flat major, five flats, B, E, A, D, and G. Scale number fourteen, G flat major, six flats, B, E, A, D, G, and C. Scale number fifteen, C flat major, seven flats, B, E, A, D, G, C, and F. It will be observed that in the above series of scales, those beginning on F sharp and G flat call for the same keys on the piano, i.e., while the notation is different, the actual tones of the scale are the same. The scales of C sharp and D flat, likewise, employ the same tones. When two scales thus employ the same tones, but differ in notation, they are said to be enharmonic. CF, page 38, Section 93. Note. The student is advised to adopt some uniform method of writing scales, preferably the one followed in those given above, the necessary sharps and flats appearing before the notes in the scales and then repeated collectively at the end as a signature. He is also advised to repeat these scales and signatures over and over until absolute familiarity is attained. E.g. E. F sharp, G sharp, A, B, C sharp, D sharp, E. Signature, four sharps, F, C, G, and D. End of chapter 7. Recording by Jillian Brandt, St. Paul, Minnesota. Chapter 8 of Music Notation and Terminology. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Music Notation and Terminology by Carl W. Gerkins Chapter 8 Scales Continued 84. The minor diatonic scale is used in several slightly different forms, but the characteristic interval between the first and third tones, which differentiates it from the major scale, remains the very same in every case. 
This interval between the first and third notes consists of four half steps in the major scale and of three half steps in the minor scale, and this difference in size has given rise to the designation major for the scale having the larger third, or minor for the scale having the smaller one. 85. The original, or primitive, form of the minor scale has its tones arranged as follows. 1. Whole step. 2. Half step. 3. Whole step. 4. Half step. 5. Half step. 6. Whole step. 7. Whole step. As its name implies, this is the oldest of the three forms, being derived from the old Greek Aeolian scale but because of the absence of a leading tone it is suitable for the simplest one part music only and is therefore little used at present eighty six the harmonic minor scale is like the primitive form except that it substitutes a tone one half step higher for the seventh tone of the older i e the primitive form this change was made because the development of writing music in several parts, particularly harmonic part writing, made necessary a leading tone, i.e. a tone with a strong tendency to move on up to the key tone as a closing point. In order to secure a tone with such a strongly upward tendency, the interval between 7 and 8 had to be reduced in size to a half step. It should be noted that this change in the seventh note of the scale caused an interval of a step and a half between the sixth and seventh tones of the scale. One, whole step. Two, half step. Three, whole step. Four, whole step. Five, half step. Six, step and a half. Seven, half step. Eighty-seven. The melodic minor scale substitutes a tone one half step higher than six as well as one and a half step higher than seven, but this change is made in the ascending scale only, the descending scale being like the primitive form. The higher sixth, commonly referred to as the raised six, was used to get rid of the unmelodic interval of a step and a half. Begin footnote. The step and a half, argumented second, is unmelodic because it is the same size as a minor third, and the mind finds it difficult to take it as a second, notes representing it being on adjacent staff degrees, an interval of the same size as a third. End footnote. Argument and second. While the return of the primitive form in descending is made because the ascending form is too much like the major tonic scale. 1. Whole step. 2. Half step. 3. Whole step. 4. Whole step. 5. Whole step. 6. Whole step. 7. Half step. 7. Whole step. 6. Half step. 5. Whole step. 4. Whole step. 3. Half step. Two whole step. This form is used only to a very limited extent, and then principally in vocal music, the harmonic form being in almost universal use in spite of the argument at second. 88. The minor scale in its various positions, up to five sharps and five flats, and in all three forms follows. A composition based on any one of these forms or upon a mixture of them, which often occurs, is said to be in the minor mode. It will be noted that the first four tones are alike in all three forms, i.e., the lower tetrachord in the minor scale is invariable, no matter what may happen to the upper tetrachord. The sign plus marks the step and a half. Note, the student is advised to recite the harmonic form of the minor scales was suggested in the case of the major scale, 
noting that the raised seventh does not affect the key signature. Example, E, F sharp, G, A, B, C, D sharp, E. Signature, one sharp, F. 89. A minor scale having the same signature as a major scale is said to be its relative minor. Example, E is the relative major of G, C of E flat, D of F, etc. The smaller letter being used to refer to the minor key or scale, while the capital letter indicates the major key or scale, unless accompanied by the word minor. Relative keys are therefore defined as those having the same signature. G and E are relative keys, as are also A and F sharp, etc. 90. A minor scale, being with the same tone as a major scale, is referred to as its tonic minor. Thus, C, with three flats in its signature, is the tonic minor of C, with all degrees in natural condition. E with one sharp is the tonic minor of E with four sharps, etc. Tonic keys are therefore those having the same key tone. The eight tones of the diatonic scale, both major and minor, are often referred to by specific names as follows. 1. Tonic, the tone. This refers to the fact that the tone is the principal tone, or generating tone of the key, i.e. it is the tone. 2. Supertonic, above the tone. 3. Median, midway between tonic and dominant. 4. Subdominant, the underdominant. This name does not refer to the position of the tone under the dominant, but the fact that the fifth below the tonic is also a dominant tone. The underdominant, just as the fifth above, is the upper dominant. Dominant, the governing tone. From the Latin word dominus, meaning master. Superdominant above the dominant, or submediant, midway between tonic and subdominant. Leading tone, the tone which demands resolution of the tonic, or half-step above it. Octave, the eighth tone. 92. The syllables commonly applied to the various major and minor scales in teaching sight singing are as follows. Begin footnote. These syllables are said to have been derived originally from the initial syllables of the Hymn to St. John, the music of which was a typical Gregorian chant. The application of these syllables to the scale tones will be made clear by reference to the hymn as given below. It will be observed that the hymn provided syllables only for the six tones of the hexachord then recognized. When the octave scale was adopted, early in the 16th century, the initial letters of the last line, S and I, were combined into a syllable for the seventh tone. End footnote. Major. Do, Re, Mi, Fa, Sol, La, Ti, Do. Minor. Original. La, Ti, Do, Re, Mi, Fa, Sol, La. Harmonic. La, Ti, Do, Re, Mi, Fa, Si, La. Melodic. La, Ti, Do, Re, Mi, Fi, Si, La, Sol, Fa, Mi, Re, Do, Ti, La. It is interesting to study the changes in both spelling and pronunciation that have occurred, and are still occurring, in these syllables. The first one, Ut was changed to do as early as the 16th century because of the difficulty of pronouncing a good tone on ut. For the same reason, and also in order to avoid having two diatonic syllables with the same initial letter, the tonic sol-fa system, invented in England about 1812 and systemized about 1850, changed c to t, and this change has been almost universally adopted by teachers of sight singing in this country. The more elaborate tonic sol fa spelling of the diatonic symbols do, la, etc., has not, however, been favorably received in this country, and the tendency seems to be toward still further simplification rather than towards elaboration. It is probable that further changes in both spelling and pronunciation will be made in the near future. 
one such change that seems especially desirable being some other syllable for re for the second tone of the major scale so that the present syllable may be reserved for flat two thus providing a uniform vowel sound for all intermediate tones of the descending chromatic scale as is already the case in the ascending form ninety three the chromatic scale begin footnote the student should differentiate between the so-called tonality scales like the major and minor the tones of which are actually used as a basis for key feeling with the familiar experience of coming home to the tone after a melodic or harmonic excursion and on the other hand the purely artificial and mechanical construction of the chromatic scale and footnote is one which proceeds always by half steps its intervals are therefore always equal no matter with what tone it begins since however we have from the standpoint of the piano keyboard five pairs of tones begin footnote most other enharmonic notations are possible although the five pairs of tones above referred to are the most common thus e sharp and f are enharmonically the same also c flat and b c sharp and b double sharp etc and footnote which are enharmonically the same it may be readily seen that the chromatic scale might be notated in all sorts of fashions and this is in fact the real status of the matter there being no one method uniformly agreed upon by composers perry grove's dictionary article chromatic recommends writing the scale with such accidentals as can occur in chromatic chords without changing the key in which the passage occurs thus taking c as a type the first accidental will be d flat as the upper note of the minor ninth on the tonic the next will be e flat the minor third of the key the next f sharp the major third of the supertonic all of which can occur without causing modulation and the remaining two will be a flat and b flat the minor sixth and seventh of the key according to this plan the chromatic scale beginning with c would be spelled c d flat d e flat e f f sharp g a flat a b flat b c the form being the same both ascending and descending this is of course written exclusively from a harmonic standpoint and the advantage of such a form is its definiteness ninety four for sight singing purposes the chromatic scale begin footnote the word chromatic means literally colored and was first applied to the intermediate tones because by using them the singer could get smoother and more diversely shaded progressions i e could get more color than by using only the diatonic tones composers were not long discovering the peculiar value of these additional tones and soon found that these same tones were exceedingly valuable also in modulating hence the two uses of intermediate tones at the present time first to establish a melody second to modulate to another key and footnote is usually written by representing the intermediate tones in ascending by sharps in some cases naturals and double sharps and the intermediate tones in the descending by flats sometimes naturals and double flats this chromatic scale in nine different positions written from this standpoint follows and the syllables most commonly applied in sight singing have also been added in the first two scales the student of harmony is asked to note that because of the very common practice of modulating to the dominant and subdominant keys the intermediate tones sharp four and flat seven are quite universally used in both ascending and descending melody patterns in other words the scale that follow would be more nearly represented actual usage if in each case sharp four phi were substituted for flat five c in the descending scale and if flat seven t were substituted for the sharp six li in the ascending form
Note. In writing chromatic scales from this sight-seeing standpoint, the student is urged to adopt a three-step process. First, writing the major diatonic scale, both ascending and descending. Second, marking the second steps. Third, inserting accidental notes, calling for the intermediate tones. In the above chromatic scales, these intermediate tones have been represented by black note heads so as to differentiate them from the notes representing diatonic scale tones. 95. The whole step scale, the third type mentioned in section 79, is, as its name implies, a scale in which the interval between the tones consists in every instance of whole steps. This reduces the number of tones in the scales to seven. Beginning with C, the scale reads C, D, E, F sharp, or G flat, A flat, B flat, C. This scale has been used somewhat extensively by the ultra-modern French school of composition represented by Debussy, Ravel, and others, but it is not making any progress towards universal adoption. The remarks of a recent English writer begin footnote, Stanford. Musical Composition, 1911, page 17, and footnote. On this subject may be interesting to the student who is puzzled by the apparent present-day tendencies of French music. He says, The student of some interesting modern developments will also speedily discover that the adoption of the so-called whole-tone scale as a basis of music is, except upon a keyed instrument tuned to the compromise of equal temperament, unnatural and impossible. No player upon a string instrument can play the scale of whole tones and arrive at an octave which is in tune with the starting note, unless he deliberately changes one of the notes on the road and alters it while playing it. The obvious result of the application of the whole tone scale to an orchestra or a string quartet would be to force them to adopt the equal temperament of the pianoforte and play every interval except the octave out of tune. When this modification had taken hold, all music in the pure scale would be distorted and destroyed, unless string players were to face the practically impossible drudgery of studying both the equal temperament and the pure scale from the start, and were able to tackle either form at a moment's notice. And thorough knowledge of the natural genesis of the scale of Western nations will be the best antidote to fads founded upon ignorance of it. It is a curious commentary upon this question that Wanger, in the opening of the third act of Tristan, bars 6 to 10, experimented with the whole tone scale and drew his pen through it, as was to be expected from a composer whose every work proves the writer to have had the pure scale inbred in him. There may be some difference of opinion among acousticians as to whether Mr. Stanford is correct in his scientific assumptions regarding the difference between tempered and pure scales. Begin footnote. Recent tests in Germany seem to prove conclusively that the tempered scale is the scale ordinarily employed by both vocalists and players on stringed instruments, and that the ideal of an agitation for a pure, i.e. untempered, scale in vocal and stringed instrument is somewhat a myth. End footnote. But even so, there is a far more potent reason why the whole step scale will probably never become as popular as the major and minor scales are now. That is, the fact that it offers no possibility of incalculating tonality feeling, which has always been the basis of the simplest primitive music. Tonality scales give rise to a feeling of alternate periods of contraction and relaxation, an active tone or chord followed by a passive one, but no such effect is possible in the whole step scale, and it seems suitable, therefore, only for the class of music whose outlines are purposefully intended to be vague and indefinite, the impressionistic style of music writing. End of chapter 8、Chapter、nine. Music Notation and Terminology by Carl W. Gerkins. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jeffrey Powers of the Geekazine Podcasts. Chapter 9 Auxiliary Words 
and endings. Number 96. Being a list of articles, adverbs, conjunctions, prepositions, and endings, often utilized in compounding terms relating to musical effects. Ah, a preposition. Variously translated to, at, for, by, in, with, towards. A cappella. In church style. A capriccio. At the fancy of the performer. A deux mains. For two hands. A mesa voce. With half voice. A la or a la. In the manner of. A la marchia in the style of a march. Asai, very or very much. Allegro assai, very fast. Ben, well. Ben marcato, well marked. Coi, can, col, cola, cole, colo. With or with thee. Can amor. With tenderness. Cola voce. With the voice. Come. As like. Come primo. As at first. Contra. Against. In compound words, it means an octave below. Da, from. Da capo, from the head. Di, by, with, of, for. Di bravura, with daring. Di molto, exceedingly, very much. Allegro di molto, exceedingly rapid. Dapio, double. Dapio movimento. Double movement. A. Ed. Et. And. Cresh et excel. Or crescent and accelerando. Louder and faster. Ensemble. Or ensemble. Together, the opposite of solo. Il. La. Le. Le. The, el basso, the bass, l'estesso tempo, the same speed, il più, the most, il più forte possible, as loudly as possible. Simo, Italian superlative ending, forte, fortissimo, ino, etto. Italian diminutive endings. Andante, andantino, poco, pochetto. Meno, less. Meno forte, less loud. Mente, the ending which changes a noun or adjective to an adverb. Largo, largamente. Mezzo or mezza. Half or medium. Mezzo forte. Medium loud. Molto. Much or very much. Molto cachet. Very much louder. Nel, nella, etc. In the or at the. Nel better. At the downbeat. Non. Not. Non tanto. Not too much. Ossia, or else. Ossia più facile, or else more easily. Per, for. Per il violino, for the violin. Più, P-E-U, spelling. Little, un più crescent, a little increase in tone. P. 
P-I-U. That's P-I accent U. More. P-I-U forte. More loudly. Poco. A little. Poco a poco. Little by little. Poi. Then. E poi la coda. And then the coda. Possibly. Possible. Forte possibly. As loudly as possible. Quasi. In the manner of allegro quasi andante, a fairly rapid movement, yet in the style of an andante, almost as slow as an andante. Sans. Without. Sans pedales. Without pedals. Sempre. Always or continually. Sempre forte. A long passage to be played forte throughout its entirety. Senza. Without. Senza accompanimento. Without accompaniment. Sino. Sin. As far as. See page 14, note. On formata, which was formerly in common use for the same purpose, but is seldom so employed at present. Solo. Alone. Opposite of ensemble. Sub. Under or lower. Subdominant. The underdominant. Tanto. Same as troppo. Tre. Three. Tre corde. Three strings. Tres. That's spelled T-R. Accent E-S. Very. Tres vivement. Very lively. Tropo. Too much. Non tanto allegro or non troppo allegro means not too fast. Una, un, uno, one, or a. Una corda. One string. Un pu. A little. A working knowledge of these auxiliary terms will aid the student greatly in arriving at the meaning of hundreds of terms without stopping to look up at each individual one. End chapter 9. Recorded by Jeffrey Powers of the Geekazine Podcasts, www.geekazine.com. Madison, Wisconsin, September 4th, 2009. of music notation and terminology. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This recording by Karen Cummins. Music Notation and Terminology by Carl Wilson Gerkins. Chapter 10. Measure. 97. From the standpoint of the eye, a measure is that portion of the staff found between two bars. In certain cases, this space may be less than a measure, as e.g. at the beginning and end of a movement. But from the standpoint of the ear, a single isolated measure is not possible, and the term must therefore be defined in the plural form. Measures are similarly accented groups of evenly spaced beats, each group having at least one accented and one non-accented beat. The strongest accent falls normally on the first beat in the measure. Two essential characteristics are involved in the ordinary musical measure. One, a group of even beats, or pulses, always felt, though not always actually sounded, one or more of these beats being stronger than the rest. Two, certain rhythmic figures. Two eighth notes, a triplet, a dotted eighth and sixteenth note, four sixteenth notes etc., which form the actual musical content of these groups. The student will note the essential difference between rhythm and measure. Rhythm is the regular recurrence of accent in a series of beats or pulses, while measure is the grouping of these beats according to some specified system. 
In listening to a piece of music, two hearers, A and B, may feel the rhythm equally strongly, but A may subjectively group the beats into one, two, one, two, etc., while B feels the groups as one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, etc. Rhythm is thus seen to be a fundamental thing inherent in the music itself, while measure is to a certain extent at least an arbitrary grouping which musicians have adopted for practical purposes. 98. In syncopation, the normal system of accenting is temporarily suspended, and the accented tone falls on the regularly unaccented part of the measure. Syncopation may therefore be defined as the temporary interruption of a normal series of accents, i.e., accenting a beat that is not usually accented. Thus, e.g., in figure 56, measure 1 has the regular system of accents normally found in four quarter measure strong accent on 1, secondary accent on 3, but measure 3 has only one accent, and it falls on the second beat. Ninety-nine. Measures are usually classified as simple and compound. A simple measure is one which has but a single accent, i.e. the measure cannot be divided into smaller constituent groups. There are two main classes of simple measures, two-beat measure and three-beat measure. A compound measure is, as its name implies, one made up by combining two or more simple measures or by the elaboration of a single measure, in slow tempo, into several constituent groups. The principal compound measures are 4-beat and 6-beat, both being referred to as compound duple measures. 5-beat, 7-beat, 9-beat, and 12-beat measures are also classified as compound measures. An English writer. Begin footnote 23. Pierce. Rudiments of Musical Knowledge, page 37. End footnote. Classifies measures as duple, triple, or quadruple, specifying that a simple measure is one in which each beat is represented by a note whose value can be divided into halves. A quarter note equals two-eighth notes, a half note equals two-quarter notes, etc. And that a compound measure is one in which each beat is represented by a dotted note whose value can be divided into three parts. A dotted quarter note equals three-eighth notes. A dotted half note equals three-quarter notes. There is thus seen to be considerable difference of opinion as to the meaning of the words simple and compound when applied in this connection, the principal question at issue being whether four-beat measure is an individual variety or whether it is a variety compounded out of two-beat measures, either by placing two of these in a group or by the elaboration of a single measure into a larger number of beats, as is often necessary in slow tempi. Perhaps the easiest way out of the difficulty is to admit that both may be true, but in different compositions. That is, it is frequently impossible to tell whether a composition that is being listened to is in two-beat or in four-beat measure. And yet, it is sometimes possible so to discriminate. Since, however, one cannot in the majority of cases distinguish between two-beat and four-beat measures, it will probably be best to leave the original classification intact and regard four-beat measure as a compound variety. 100. The commonest varieties of measure are 1. Duple, sometimes called even measure or even time, in which there are two beats, the first one being accented. Examples of duple measure are 2 over 4, 2 over 8, 2 over 2, 2 quarter, begin footnote 24. For explanation of terminology, see page 48, section 106. End footnote 24. 2 eighth and 2 half measure, respectively. 2, triple, the old perfect measure, in which there are three beats the first one being accented, the second and third unaccented. Examples are 3 over 8, 3 over 4, 3 over 2, 
three eighth, three quarter, and three half measure, respectively. Three, quadruple, in which there are four beats, the first and third being accented, primary accent on one, secondary accent on three, the second and fourth unaccented. See note above under section 99. Four, sextuple, in which there are six beats, the first and fourth being accented, the others not. In rapid tempi, this is always taken as compound duple measure, a dotted quarter note having a beat. It will be noted that the two measures, in 6-8 time measure A, 6-8 notes, and measure B, two dotted quarter notes, are identical in effect with, in 2-4 time, two sets of triple eighth notes, in measure A, and in measure B, two quarter notes. 101. Other varieties of measure sometimes found are 9 over 8 and 12 over 8, but these are practically always taken as 3-beat and 4-beat measures respectively, being equivalent to these if each group of three tones is thought of as a triplet. In 9 eighths time, 6 eighth notes followed by a dotted quarter is identical in effect with, in 3-4 time, two sets of eighth note triplets followed by a quarter note. 102. Quintuple, 5-beat, and septuple, 7-beat, measures are occasionally met with, but these are rare and will always be sporadic. The 5-beat measure is taken as a combination of 3 and 2, or of 2 and 3, sometimes a mixture of both in the same composition, while the 7-beat measure is taken in groups of 4 and 3, or of 3 and 4. 103. The sign that looks like C in an open measure is usually understood to mean four-quarter measure, and the sign C with a vertical slash through it, two-half measure. But usage varies somewhat, and the second sign is sometimes used to indicate four-half measure. It may be safely said, however, that the sign C with a vertical slash through it always indicates that a half note has a beat. Two Cs with a vertical slash through it may occasionally be found indicating four-half measure, but this is rare. The student will note that the sign that looks like a C in an open measure is not a letter C, but an incomplete circle, differentiating two-beat, imperfect, measure from three-beat, perfect, measure. See Appendix A, page 106. End of Chapter 10 This recording was by Karen Cummins. A voice actor in Atlanta, Georgia, you can visit my website at karencummins.com. Of music notation and terminology. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Music notation and terminology by Carl Wilson Gerkins. Chapter 11 Tempo 104. The word time in musical nomenclature has been greatly abused, having been used to indicate 1. Rhythm, as the time was wrong, 2. Variety of measure signature, as 2 for time, 3. Rate of speed, as the time was too slow. To obviate the confusion naturally resulting from this threefold and inexact use of the word, many teachers of music are adopting certain changes in terminology as noted in sections 105, 106, and 107. Such changes may cause some confusion at first, but seem to be necessary if our musical terminology is to be at all exact. 105. The first of the changes mentioned in the above paragraph is to substitute the word rhythm for the word time when correcting mistakes involving misplaced accent, etc. Your rhythm in the third measure of the lower score was wrong instead of, your time was wrong. 106. The second change mentioned would eliminate such blind and misleading expressions as 2-4 time, 3-4 time, 4-4 time, 6-8 time, etc., and substitute, therefore, such self-explanatory designations as 2-quarter measure, 3-quarter measure, 4-quarter measure, 6-eighth measure, etc., e.g., the first movement of the Beethoven Sonata, Opus 2, No. 3, is in four-quarter measure. 107. 
The third change referred to above would substitute the word tempo, plural tempi, for the word time in all allusions to rate of speed, e.g., the scherzo was played in very rapid tempo. The word tempo has been used in this connection so long by professional musicians that there can be no possible objection to it on the ground of its being a foreign word. In fact, there is a decided advantage in having a word that is understood in all countries where modern music, i.e. civilized music, is performed. And just here is found the principal reason for the popularity of the Italian language in musical terminology. Schumann, MacDowell, and other well-known composers have tried to break down this popularity by using their own respective vernaculars in both tempo and dynamic indications, but in spite of these attempts, the Italian language is still quite universally used for this purpose, and deservedly so, for if we are to have a music notation that is universal, so that an American is able to play music written by a Frenchman, or a German, or a Russian, then we ought also to have a certain number of expressions referring to tempo, etc., which will be understood by all, i.e., a music terminology that is universal." The Italian language was the first in the field, is the most universally known in this particular at the present time, and is entirely adequate. It should therefore be retained in use as a sort of musical Esperanto. 108. There are several ways of finding the correct tempo of a composition. 1. From the metronomic indication found at the beginning of many compositions, thus, e.g., the mark MM92, Meltzel's metronome 92, means that if the metronome, either Meltzel's or some other reliable make, is set with a sliding weight at the figure 92, there will be 92 clicks per minute, and they will serve to indicate to the player or singer the rate at which the beats, or pulses, should follow one another. This is undoubtedly the most accurate means of determining tempi, in spite of slight inaccuracies in metronomes. Begin footnote. To test the accuracy of a metronome, set the weight at 60, and see if it beats seconds. If it gives more than 62 or 63, or less than 57 or 58 clicks per minute, it will not be of much service in giving correct tempi, and should be taken to a jeweler to be regulated. End footnote. And of the mistakes which composers themselves often make in giving metronomic indications. 2. Another means of determining the tempo of a composition is to play it at different tempi, and then to choose the one that feels right for that particular piece of music. This is perhaps the best means of getting at the correct tempo, but is open only to the musician of long experience, sure judgment, and sound scholarship. 3. A third method of finding tempi is through the interpretation of certain words, used quite universally by composers to indicate the approximate rate of speed and the general mood of compositions. The difficulty with this method is that one can hardly find two composers who employ the same word to indicate the same tempo, so that no absolute rate of speed can be indicated, and in the last analysis the conductor or performer must fall back on the second method cited above, i.e., individual judgment. 109. In spite of the inexactness of use in the case of expressions relating to tempo, these expressions are nevertheless extremely useful in giving at least a hint of what was in the composer's mind as he conceived the music that we are trying to interpret. Since a number of the terms overlap in meaning, and since the meaning of no single term is absolute, these expressions relating to tempo are best studied in groups. Perhaps the most convenient grouping is as follows. 1. Grave, literally weighty, serious, larghissimo, adagissimo, and lentissimo, indicating the very slowest tempo used in rendering music. 2. Largo, begin footnote, largo, larghetto, etc., are derivatives of the Latin word largus, meaning large, broad. End footnote. Adagio, begin footnote, adagio means literally, at ease, end footnote, and lento, 
indicating quite a slow tempo. 3. Larghetto, i.e. a little largo, and adagietto, a little adagio, a slow tempo, but not quite so slow as largo, etc. 4. Andante, going, or walking, as contrasted with running, and andantino, indicating a moderately slow tempo. Andantino is now quite universally taken slightly faster than andante, in spite of the fact that if andante means going, and if ino is the diminutive ending, then andantino means going less, i.e. more slowly. 5. Moderato, a moderate tempo. 6. Allegro and Allegretto. Begin footnote. There has been some difference of opinion as to which of these two terms indicates the more rapid tempo. An analysis tells us that if allegro means quick, and if etto is the diminutive ending, then allegretto means a little quick, i.e., slower than allegro. These two terms are, however, so closely allied in meaning that a dispute over the matter is a mere waste of breath. End footnote. A moderately quick tempo, allegretto being usually interpreted as meaning a tempo somewhat slower than allegro. The word allegro means literally happy, joyous, and this literal meaning is still sometimes applicable, but in the majority of instances the term refers only to rate of speed. 7. Vivo, vivace, literally lively. A tempo between allegro and presto. 8. Presto, prestissimo, vivacissimo, and prestissimo possibile. The most rapid tempo possible. End of chapter 11. Read by Kara Schallenberg, www.kray.org, on August 4, 2009, in San Diego, California. Of Music Notation and Terminology. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Music Notation and Terminology by Carl Wilson Gerkins. Chapter 12. Tempo continued. 110. Innumerable combinations of the words defined in section 109 with one another and with other words occur. Some of these combinations with their approximate meanings follow. The meaning of any such expression not found in the list may usually be arrived at by consulting the terms defined in paragraph 109 and recalling the use of certain auxiliary terms quoted in chapter 9. Largo assai, very slow. Largo di molto, very slow. Largo manantropo, slow but not too slow. Largo un poco, slow, but not so slow as largo, cf. larghetto. Lentamente, slowly. Lentando, with increasing slowness. Tre lentement, very slowly. Lentisamente, very slowly. Lentisamamente, very slowly. Lento assai, very slowly. Lento a capriccio, slowly but capriciously. Lento di molto, very slowly. Andante affettuoso, moderately slow, and with tenderness and pathos. Andante amabile, moderately slow and lovingly. Andante cantabile, moderately slow and in singing style. Andante grazioso, moderately slow and gracefully. Andante maestoso, moderately slow and majestically. Andante con moto, slightly faster than andante. Andante ma non troppo, not too slowly. Andante pastorale, moderately slow and in simple and unaffected style, literally rural, pastoral. Andante quasi allegro, almost as rapid in tempo as allegro, literally, an andante in the style of allegro. Andante sostenuto, 
moderately slow and sustained. Allegrissimo, much faster than allegro. The superlative degree of allegro. Allegro agitato, a moderately rapid tempo and in agitated style. Allegro appassionata, a moderately rapid tempo and in passionate style. Allegro assai, very allegro, faster than allegro. Allegro comodo, a conveniently rapid tempo. Allegro con brio, an allegro played in a brilliant style, faster than allegro. Allegro con fuoco, an allegro played with fire, i.e., with extreme animation, faster than allegro. Allegro con spirito, an allegro performed with spirit. Allegro con moto, faster than allegro. Allegro di bravura, an allegro performed in brilliant style, i.e., demanding great skill in execution. Allegro furioso, furiously, quicker than allegro, very brilliant. Allegro giusto, an allegro movement, but in exact rhythm. Allegro ma grazioso, an allegro played in graceful style. Allegro ma non tanto, an allegro movement, but not too rapid. Allegro ma non troppo, an allegro movement, but not too rapid. Allegro ma non presto, an allegro movement, but not too rapid. Allegro moderato, slower than allegro. Allegro vivace, faster than allegro. Presto assai, as rapidly as possible. Presto ma non troppo, a presto movement, but not too rapid. 111. There are certain terms which indicate a modification of the normal tempo of a movement, these being divided into two classes, a, those terms which indicate in general a slower tempo, and b, those which indicate in general a more rapid tempo. The further subdivisions of these two classes are shown below. a. Terms indicating a slower tempo. 1. Terms indicating a gradual retard. Ritinente, rit, ritinuto, rit, ritardando, rit, rallentando, ral, slentando. 2. Terms indicating a tempo which is to become definitely slower at once. Piu lento, literally more slowly. Menomoso, literally less movement. 3. Terms indicating a slower tempo combined with an increase in power. Largando, allargando. These words are both derived from largo, meaning large, broad. For terms indicating both slower tempo and softer tone, see page 59, section 127. The student should note the difference between groups 1 and 2 as given above. The terms in group 1 indicate that each measure, and even each pulse in the measure, is a little slower than the preceding one, while such terms as piu lento and menomoso indicate a rate of speed becoming instantly slower and extending over an entire phrase or passage. Some composers, e.g. Beethoven and Couperin, have evidently had this same distinction in mind between rallentando and ritardando on the one hand, and ritenuto and ritenente on the other, considering the former, ral and rit, to indicate a gradually slackening speed, and the latter, ritenuto and ritenente, to indicate a definitely slower rate. The majority of composers do not, however, differentiate between them in this way, and it will therefore hardly be worth while for the student to try to remember the distinction. b. Terms indicating a more rapid tempo. 1. Terms indicating a gradual acceleration. Accelerando, affrettando, this term implies some degree of excitement also. Stringendo, poco a poco animato. 2. Terms indicating a tempo which is to become definitely faster at once. Piu allegro, piu tosto, piu mosso, stretto, un poco animato. 112. After any modification in tempo, either faster or slower, has been suggested, 
it is usual to indicate a return to the normal rate by some such expression as a tempo, literally in time, a tempo primo, literally in the first time, tempo primo, or tempo. 113. Tempo rubato, or a tempo rubato, means literally in robbed time, i.e., duration taken from one measure or beat and given to another, but in modern practice the term is quite generally applied to any irregularity of rhythm or tempo not definitely indicated in the score. The terms ad libitum, ad lib, a piacere, and a capriccio also indicate a modification of the tempo at the will of the performer. Ad libitum means at liberty, a piacere, at pleasure, and a capriccio, at the caprice of the performer. 114. The term tempo giusto is the opposite of tempo rubato, and of the other terms defined in paragraph 113. It means literally in exact time. Tempo giusto is sometimes translated quite rapidly. Begin footnote. Bustler, Elements of Notation and Harmony, page 76. End footnote. But this is very unusual. 115. Le stesso tempo means at the same rate of speed, e.g., when a measure signature changes from 2-4 to 6-8, with a change in beat note from a quarter to a dotted quarter, but with the same tempo carried through the entire movement. 116. Tenuto, 10, indicates that a tone or chord is to be held to its full value. This word is sometimes used after a staccato passage to show that the staccato effect is to be discontinued, but is often used merely as a warning not to slight a melody tone, i.e., to give it its full value. 117. Veloce means swiftly, and is applied to brilliant passages, e.g. cadenzas, which are to be played as rapidly as possible without much regard for measure rhythm. The words rapidamente, brillante, and volante, flying, have the same meaning as veloce. 118. The following expressions referring to tempo are also in common use, but cannot easily be classified with any of the groups already defined. Con moto, with motion, i.e., not too slow. Pesante, slowly, heavily. Doppio movimento, twice as rapid as before. Tempo ordinario, in ordinary tempo. Tempo comodo, in convenient tempo. Sempre lento malinconico assai, always slowly and in a very melancholy style. Animando animato con anima, with animation. Agitato, agitated. 119. Tempo di marcia is given by Riemann, Dictionary of Music, page 783, as equivalent to Andante, MM, 72-84. to The same writer gives Tempo di menuetto as equivalent to Allegretto, and Tempo di valso as equivalent to Allegro moderato, which he regards as indicating a more rapid tempo than Allegretto. End of chapter 12 Read by Kara Schallenberg, www.kray.org, on August 4th, 2009, in San Diego, California.